You know, a lot of times um, when we talk, we use the word blessed. Now, in, in um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, or in the heavenlies. And the word blessed there means to praise. When it says praise God, it means, or bless God, it means praise God. But then it says he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And, you know, we use that term, or it's used in different ways. In the Old Testament, it, it, the word blessed sometimes is happy. Blessed is the man. Um, and, and that's the way we use it many times. Are you blessed? We say, are you blessed? And, of course, you are blessed regardless of how you feel. But <laughs> we, we mean it in the terms of, are you things going well? Are you happy? Is everything all right? And so on and so forth. And, you know, we should be blessed all the time. We should, you know, have an understanding uh, that we are blessed. And no matter what's going on, God's watching over us. He's working to do our best for us. One of the first things I learned, and this is a, this is a teaching on how, how to stay blessed. And, you know, the Bible is a book on how in some many respects. And one thing I learned early in my life, and my mother pounded into my brain, is to always be thankful. And, you know, kids are not always thankful, are they? <laughs> kids are only concerned with, um, you know, uh, immediate gratification. You know, if they're not gratified, if they don't get what they want, they become unthankful. And, um, you know. We all go through that stage in life, and hopefully we grow out of it. But my mom was really persistent in, in reminding me to be thankful, you know, that I was healthy, I was strong, you know, and the blessings that we had in our life, you know, a nice, loving family, and, you know, we didn't have all the material things that some people had, but, you know, I grew up in Long Island. I had all these Jewish friends, and some of them were pretty well-to-do. And, and, you know, I'd go to their house and they had things that we didn't have. Or people got to go places that we didn't go. But overall, you know, I had a great childhood. And, but one of the things that I learned in that childhood as I grew older was to be thankful. And we are to be thankful for the things that we do have in this life and the blessings that God gives us. And also we are to be thankful for the things that are to come. Right? The promises that God has, our inheritance, what's in the future. So there are two things to keep our lives uh, vital and blessed and joyful, and that is to be thankful, and the other thing is to be giving. Those are two vital keys of life that God puts out there in many different ways, in examples, in verses, and all kinds of ways. And when we focus on what God has done for us and the things we are to be thankful for, and we, we focus on blessing others and helping others, we usually do pretty good. We, we are pretty even-keeled and, and blessed and moving forward. When we start to focus on ourselves, you know what we see? We see our own inadequacies. We see things that we think we lack. We think, oh, i got to have this and i got to have that. You know, and pretty much the things that we think we have to have, we don't really need, you know. Um, now, if you can have them, it's great. There's, that's not a problem. But, you know, we should be thankful. And if we can't have them or if it's not, you know, how many cars do you need? How many color TVs do you need? How many pairs of shoes do you need? Huh. <laughs> how many... How many pocketbooks do you need? I don't need any pocketbooks, but how many pocketbooks do you need or purses? How many, you know, how many golf balls do you need? I have about 3,000 in the garage. Okay, well, anyway, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. So we need to focus on being thankful and focus on giving. If we, those two keys in life will make such a difference such an incredible difference in how we live our lives. In verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That is a very straightforward, simple 
but powerful verse. And what are we to give thanks? In everything. In everything we are to give thanks. We're to be thankful for everything. For this is the will of God. That is God's will that we are to be thankful. Could it be any simpler? Could it be any more plain? Could it be any more direct? So the next time you think about not being happy or unblessed or unthankful, think about that verse. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you know, in Christ Jesus because, why? Because everything we have, everything we are, uh, who we are is in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God are in him, yea, and amen. Wow. You know, we are heirs of the promises because of Jesus Christ. We are, you know, we have the inheritance with the saints in light because of Jesus Christ. We have Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ. We have eternal life because of Jesus Christ. Everything that we have, we have because everything that really matters, I should put it that way, everything that we have that really matters is in Christ Jesus. What a great thing. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 13, it says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So here, Paul is saying we are thankful for other believers that believe, and, and we are to be thankful for each other. You know, I'm so thankful that all you guys showed up today. <laughs> risking, you know, whatever you're risking. <laughs> the plague. You know, but it's just to hear God's word. That's the real reason you're here. And then to bless each other. You know, and every time you come, you can come and you can be blessed and you can bless. You can encourage each other and, and be thankful for each other and love one another and, and tell each other how nice it is to see each other. You know, because you know what? We're stuck with each other forever. <laughs> forever. What a cool thing. You know, in chapter 3, verse 13, it says, and brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You know, and well-doing is what? Doing God's, will. doing God's will. That's right. And a big part of doing God's will is what? Being thankful. And we just saw we're to be thankful in everything, and we're to be thankful for each other. And then, you know, giving. You know, it said the giving of thanks, right? We're to give thanks. Give, that's giving. We're to give thanks in everything. Who do we give thanks to? God. God. That's right. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. I could have saved this for Thanksgiving, but it's what was on my heart to teach. You know, it's, I pray to God and I ask him what I should teach. And One of the things I looked at, if you have time sometime, and I think I've taught it in fellowship years ago, is Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, the psalmist starts out with, I'm going to paraphrase it, life sucks. <laughs> Things are going bad. My sore runneth through the night. I refuse comfort. God's forsaken me. Everything's gone to hell in a handbasket. And then he goes, and then I remembered all the good things God's given me and all the good things God's done for me. And that's the way he gets out of the depression and the funk, by being thankful for everything that God's done for him, remembering all that God has done. Well, you know, in the Old Testament, he did do a lot for him, didn't he? But not near what he's done for us. You know, because we have an inheritance, right? They could lose the inheritance. They could lose it, you know. In, in life, you know, if, if you have an inheritance from your parents, your parents can write you out of the will, can't they? They can just 
He's done. I don't want him to get anything. He hasn't been a good son or a good daughter, you know, whatever. Not God. Doesn't matter how good a son or daughter you are, you still get the inheritance. You're still joint heirs with Christ. Chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 15. This is really a cool because it's about something practical. It's, it's very practical advice. It says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, you should probably read the preceding verses just to catch up a little bit on stuff. Um, but to walk circumspectly is to walk precisely, carefully, to be wise, not foolish with your life. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Meaning, you know, every day, you get, today is October 11th, right? right? Am I right? October 11th? I forget sometimes. Uh, you only get one shot at October 11th, 2020, and that's it. Once it's gone, it's gone. You know, it's not like a Superman movie where you, you fly against the rotation of the earth faster than the speed of light and you can go back in time. That's just in movies and, and fantasies. That's an impossibility. There's no time machines. You get one shot at this day. And God says you should be thankful for it and make the best of it. And the days are evil, meaning you just have one shot. That's it. Once it's done, it's done. It's over. Verse 17, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, we already saw one thing that the Lord's will was. In everything, give thanks, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. This is a repetitive teaching. <laughs> Redundant, maybe. And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, this is a pretty cool verse, because it Juxtaposes, juxtaposes two things, or it brings into contrast two things. You know, in life, people drink spirits, wine, alcohol, beer, liquor. You ever watch the TV commercials on, they're doing now these uh, hard cider and, and you know, all these different forms of alcohol, and they show these people having these great parties and great times. It's like, this is the whole object of life is to have a party and get drunk. And then they have a little thing on the bottom, please drink responsibly. <laughs> they had, I, watched, I saw one yesterday. They, they put this tarp in a, uh, in a pickup truck, and they filled it with water, and it said a mobile swimming pool, and they're drinking and diving into, <laughs> you know, give me a break. It's ridiculous. So here it says, be not drunk with wine. Where is that? You know, spirits. <laughs> Don't be drunk with wine. doesn't say you can't have a drink. What does it say? Don't be drunk. It's pretty straightforward. But be filled with the Spirit. That's what you should be filled with. Filled with the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. That's a much better high. It's so much more exciting to be filled with God's Spirit and to see God work in your life and do things. What a cool thing to do, to walk with God. Speaking to yourselves. My wife sometimes will say, you're talking to yourself. <laughs> I'm doing the word, honey. <laughs> Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Psalms, Bollinger says a psalm is a song in commemoration of mercies received. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. That was what he concluded the word psalm here meant. It, it means a song of commemoration of mercies received. And mercies received is God's help, him pouring out his help to bring you out of your misery, out of your, you know, whatever you're in or whatever you need. And then spiritual songs is the word odes, O-D-E-S. That's where we get the word ode. It's the same word in Greek. 
And an ode in English means a song of praise, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it's, it's songs relating to spiritual things, you know, spiritual things that would be bought, things of God. And making melody is to sing or chant in your heart to God. What a cool verse. Giving, you know, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. See, Stella, when I'm talking to myself, that's what I'm doing. Okay. And then it says in verse 20, giving thanks. How often? Always. Always. Not once in a while, not a lot, not most of the time, but always. You know, and sadly enough, probably sometimes we do it rarely, you know, or we do it intermittently. But we're to do it always. We're to always give thanks unto God for all things, unto, for all things, always for all things. You know, in Thessalonians said, giving thanks in everything. But here it says, always for all things, unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a cool verse, you know? What a cool section. You know, what great advice, you know? So when you're using your time wisely, redeeming the time wisely, one of the things you should be doing is being thankful, giving thanks. Let's go to Colossians, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 12. And this, this, is fo this is following a bunch of things where it's a prayer for us to be filled with knowledge and understanding that we might walk worthy and be strengthened with might. And then verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or adequate to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. See, I told you that was true. Forgot that I had that verse in there. But God, we are to be thankful that God has made us adequate. We didn't make ourselves adequate. We didn't earn the inheritance. We, didn't, we weren't so great or so good that we got. You know, if you go back in the Old Testament and you look at God speaking to Israel, and Israel was getting ready to go into the promised land. And, you know, Israel was so, if you read the Gospels, how they were so sure of how righteous they were. And, you know, we're Jews. And everybody else was nothing, basically. Right? But in Deuteronomy, God says, you know, I didn't call you and choose you because you were so great. I didn't choose you because you were the greatest of people, but the smallest of people. But I called you because I loved Abraham, and I loved Isaac, and I loved Jacob, and I made promises to them. And here you are. You're getting it. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. They just got it. The promised land. The promised land, which was a land that flowed with milk and honey. And, you know, all the other stuff that was there. You know, they got it all for nothing, just for being born into the right family. Well, you know, we got born into the right family. Yeah, we got born again into the right family, and so we got the inheritance. And it says here that, you know, we are to give thanks unto the Father for making us adequate, you know, because he wiped out every negative thing in your life. Everything. And said, you're perfect, and you deserve a great inheritance. So enjoy it. Be thankful. Who hath delivered us, speaking of God, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated or transported us into the kingdom of or by his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the remission of sin. It says forgiveness, but it is remission. And then let's go to chapter 3 of Colossians. And it says in verse 15, and let, that means what? You have to allow, you have to allow 
the peace of God to rule in your hearts. You know, we heard in the manifestations about God's comfort and joy. It says in Corinthians that God is the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies. And he's a God of peace. He's the God of peace. And it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. How peaceful is God? You know, just think about if, just pretend for a second you were God and you knew all the answers and you had all the power. How peaceful would you be? You know, you, you ever go into a situation where you know you're absolutely right, you know you have all the answers, you know that you got it? It's peaceful, isn't it? I know when I was in school and when I didn't study and I didn't have all the answers, I'd get really nervous. I had no peace. But when it was something I was really confident about and I had all the answers and I knew my subject, I was peaceful. I was peaceful. Well, we have the peace of God. God has all the answers. And if God has all the answers and we have God, we have all the answers we need. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That means have dominion. You know, so whenever there's anxiety, whenever there's fear, what do you need to do? You need to get peaceful with God. That's how you overcome anxiety and fear. To which, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye what? Thankful. thankful. So, is there any reason why you shouldn't be thankful? No, none. There's no reason why you shouldn't be thankful. There's no excuse. There's no reason. There's no strategy. There's no anything why you shouldn't be thankful. We're to be thankful always for all things. It covers a lot. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. So when you're thankful, I think thankful and peaceful are connected. Romans chapter 1. Here's the negative side, just so you know. Comes right after the section where it talks about believing God's word. Verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from believing to believing. As it is written, the just shall live by believing. For the wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in what? Unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they... Man is without excuse. In other words, it is obvious by the creation that there is a God. It's, it's totally obvious and clear that there is a God, and therefore man is without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And that's what happens with unthankfulness. You know, when you're unthankful, then you um, decline into vainness of your reasoning and logic, and their foolish heart is darkened. You know, it becomes evil. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what happens. When you, when you reject God, you become foolish. When you look to God for the answers, you become wise. When you turn your back on God, you have anxiety and fear and doubt and worry. And when you go to God, you have peace and comfort and understanding. What a choice. And yet people make the wrong choice all the time, don't they? Or they mock God. But what's their alternative? I remember years ago, I was at, uh, some of you remember, some of you have never seen it probably, it was a movie called PFL 77, right? And they interviewed some people, and one guy um, 
he said, I remember it was uh, uh, one of the straw holes. Um, he goes, I guess it was his brother witnessing to him. And he said, here's your choice. He said, you have 80 years and a hole in the ground, or you have eternal life. You know, what's your choice? <laughs> and that's really the choice, isn't it? Okay, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, verse 15. It says, By him, therefore, speaking about Jesus Christ, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You know, in the Old Testament, they had the sacrifice, but they had the sacrifice for different reasons. They had the sacrifice for sin. They had the sacrifice to praise God. They had the sacrifice, if, you know, for different things, you know, all kinds of different sacrifices. They had a sacrifice. Um, the Levites had a sacrifice daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, quarterly, all kinds of stuff. But we are to offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That's not very hard, is it? It doesn't cost you anything. Continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So what does that say? Giving thanks is praise to God, and it's our sacrifice. Think about that. That's a pretty great thing. It's a pretty easy thing. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with sacrifices to God, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So these things are all included as sacrifices. Right? Now, not in the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, it had to be a lamb or an oxen or a bullock or a red heifer. It was a red heifer. That was a really special one. Uh, or a turtle dove or something else. Or you had to make a cake and it had to be with certain kind of flour and a certain kind of oil and, you know, you had to, whatever. And you had to do these sacrifices and it had to be a certain way at a certain time and you had to be cleansed and it had to be, the animal had to be perfect without spot, without blemish. And here it says, the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And the word communicate there is the word koinonio, which means fellowship or to share fully, which means to give. Pretty cool, huh? It's to share or to give fully. That's a sacrifice. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Pretty great. Let's go to back to Colossians. So you see, giving and thanks, thankfulness are kind of related. Because when you're thankful, you're giving. And when you're giving, you're thankful. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As we have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How do we receive? Well, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's, that's how we receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith or in believing, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with what? Thanksgiving. thanksgiving. We abound with thanksgiving. Cool. So we give thanks to God. We are to be thankful for all things that he has done for us and continues to do for us and will do for us in the future, as he has promised in his word. He has given us that inheritance. We also are to give to others in all kinds of ways. We're to be thankful to be with each other, and we're to give thanks for each other, and we're to give thanks for everything that God has done for us, and we are to share. Those are the, ex the sacrifices that are well-pleasing to God. And we are to... Um, always give to others in other ways, in our material abundance, but also in our lives and in our service to God 
and into the, his son, Jesus Christ, and into the body of Christ. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. I kind of did a lot on Thanksgiving and a little bit on giving because if you get Thanksgiving, you'll get giving. <laughs> chapter 20, verse 25, this is Jesus Christ. And he says, he called them unto him, the disciples. And he said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Chapter 20 of Matthew, verse 25. 25. So he's talking about the greatness of the Gentiles and how you know, they exercise their authority over the people. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or servant, one that serves. A minister is one that runs to serve. And we are all called to serve in some way or another. And ho whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Dulos, a bond slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ was the great example of giving. What did he give? Everything. He gave it all. In all religions, all religions other than true Christianity, and I mean true Christianity, all religions to be spiritual is to be more separated from people and to be receive more adulation and service from the people. To be more spiritual and true Christianity is to be more with the people and to be more of a servant to the people and serve them and bless them. So if you want to be spiritual, be thankful and be giving. Be a servant. Let's go to John chapter 13. Three, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Okay, in the biblical culture and times, people uh, were pretty clean. You know, because it was part of their culture. And they, you know, when, when they had to go to temple, they would wash, right? And were clean, but the one part that would get dirty again would be their feet because they wore sandals. And so when you went to somebody's house, one of the things that they would do, the lowest servant in the household would wash the feet of the guest as they came into the house and get down on his knees and wash their feet and, you know, dry them off. And so Jesus Christ was doing what for his disciples? He was washing their feet. So he was giving them the example of being the lowest of servants, the, the servant of all, right? You know, there was a hierarchy of servants. Uh, you know, the top servant would be like the steward of the house, and he had a lot of power and a lot of, and he would never wash anybody's feet except probably his own, maybe the master's. But then, you know, if you went down the ladder, the lowest servant would be the one that washed everybody's feet, and he would wash the feet of the people that came in off the street. So, so Jesus Christ is there, he gets the basin, he gets the water, he, he girds himself and he's, he's wiping everybody's feet off. And then cometh, he cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter saith to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, Thou hast no part with me. Peter didn't get it. He didn't understand what Jesus Christ was doing. 
He's a little thick. And he thought, you know, you're my Lord. You can't wash my feet. You know, he had that opposite. The Pharisees, what did the Pharisees do? What was the, what was the example of a, of a religious man or the priests? They were up here and everybody else was down there. So that, you know, that's, that was what they had in their culture, in their life, because it was religion. So Jesus Christ said, um, Simon, uh, I'm an eight. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He is that washeth needeth not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Referred to Judas, which he gets to. Okay? For he knew that who should betray him, therefore he saith, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, he was set down again and said unto them, Know ye not what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Take care of one another. Watch over one another. Serve one another. Give to one another. Be thankful for one another. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Happy are ye. Blessed are ye. <laughs> if you do those things, what a cool thing. I was going to go into, uh, and, and so what would that serving do? That would be giving, right? That would be giving in the body of Christ. I was going to go into Romans chapter 12, but I, I think I taught long enough. Romans chapter 12 starts off with, you know, God beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And then it says, renew your mind. And then it goes into the one body and how we are to function in the body. What you can do to bless the body of Christ. You know, that's what we're called to do. We're called to speak the word, to bring other people into the body of Christ. And then in the body of Christ, we are here to bless one another, to help one another, to serve one another, to give, to love to do our best for one another, you know? And we are to be thankful, and, and those things are what God cares about, you know? We are to be thankful in all things, always. You know, we're, and we are to bless one another. We're to take care of one another. So if you want to stay blessed for the rest of your life, make, no. Um, if you want to be blessed, the how of being blessed is to be thankful and to be giving. It's so simple. Two simple principles in life. You know, be thankful all. Wake up in the morning and be thankful. When you go to bed at night, be thankful. And in between, be thankful all the time. Sing praises to God in your heart and just be thankful. And then wherever you have an opportunity to give and to serve, take that opportunity and do the best that you can and give it all you got.